saying, just wait. Just wait for sounds to become apparent. Notice how, just what waiting feels like. Let the sounds come to you. Waiting is a quite an interesting attitude to bring into meditation because so often we're trying to get something. So you're just listening, waiting, and then sounds become apparent. And notice the silence in that waiting. No need to comment. Just listening. Feel your face. Localize attention on the face. And again, wait. And let the feelings in the face become conscious. No need to think about this. Bring attention to the center of your chest. Feel the heart. And wait again. And let the feelings in the heart become conscious. And notice the silence of knowing of awareness. So be that silent awareness. Now stimulate the heart chakra, breathing in, may I be well. Breathing out, may all beings be well. Stay centered at the chest. Let the feelings in the chest be conscious, whatever they might be. So on the in-breath, welcoming goodness. Out-breath, giving out goodness. Use the breath as calming, use the heart as opening. Okay, let's just be quiet for the rest of the city. Can you can you hear us now? Can we use this? Can we play it here? Can everyone still hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Can we and you can see me too. Okay, good. <clears throat> So I guess I'll just start. Can I can I uh, request the talk? Can you hear me? Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputassa. Uttam dhammang sankhang namasa. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Lots of familiar faces. Hope you're doing well, free of sickness. Um, as you know, we have a winter retreat. Uh, January, February, March is our retreat period. And so we finish that. Now we're gearing up for a very interesting year, I think. We have a lot of senior monks coming as guests, and we hope to finish our our Dharma Hall by October. So it's going to be a busy, busy, good year. Um, and this is my first Zoom session for a long time, so I'm apprehensive to see what I can say. 
Mm -hmm. So I've been, um, I just put a new warp on my loom and uh, I want to try uh, a weaving design called Crockboard, which is a Swedish, Scandinavian way of design. And when you when I look at the books on this design or many types of weaving, one of the words they always say is, how do you resolve the salvages? So the salvages are the edges, right, of a, of a fabric, or in this case, a rug. And I was thinking about the word resolve. How do you resolve the salvages? Um, and pondering the limitations of thought. So let's say if I ask you what is the square what is the square root of forty eight thousand six hundred and twenty four right you, you probably all remember your high school math and you just figure it out in your head you have or you go to Google but you would use thought. And that's the domain of thought, solving problems such as that. Or say the accounts here at the monastery, those are very exact and very definite and there are rules to accounting. And if the uh, balance sheet is out by $10, it's not right. So there's an exactness to it, precision, and this is the realm of thought. So thought resolves the square root of 48,624, or it resolves the uh, inaccuracies in the um, bank balances or, or whatever. That's the realm of thought. But say to, to run a monastery or develop a monastery, if one had to think everything out beforehand, we never would have started. So we started the monastery 16, 17 years ago with just a kind of reasonable optimism. Yeah, it's worked before. We have some experience. There are a few people interested. Should we go for it? Yeah, let's go for it. If we would have thought through all the possibilities and difficulties, and of course, we would never have started. You'd never get anywhere. So that's where the realm of thought is limited. That's where the realm of thought can be actually quite crippling because there's no initiative, there's no, um, there isn't a willingness maybe to go into the unknown. But thought is useful because it has to be a, a, a reasonable consideration, a reasonable possibility. Recently, um, as most of you probably know who are in Canada, we had these very, very tragic murders in Ottawa and where uh, six people died, four children, two adults. And I was at the, there was a large public funeral, which was very, very moving. The family was there. There were five coffins in front. It was a very, it was a really heartbreaking uh, occasion. And the, the mayor was there. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau had sent a message. The MP was there. The MPPs were there, um, with a lot of heart, a lot of a lot of heart for this very, very tragic occurrence in our in our good city. Now, the response of that, how do you resolve that? Well, I think all of us very easily are brokenhearted. Our hearts are 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 deeply, deeply touched by such an occasion. That's not, that's not problematic at all to know that and to be that. And that's obviously not a thought. Thinking comes, sure, why did this happen? Um, the police have to think about it. So many people have to think about the various factors involved, but say there's some response that I have, and most of us have it, that funeral is heartfelt it really really hurt it really really hurt um, but is that bad 
No, not at all, actually. It's very human. It's such a, it, it's a very, um, I don't want to say a good thing. It's a very important thing to, to know the world from the heart. We can do that. We can, we can know the world from thought through analysis, and we do much of that, but also we can, we can um, feel the world. We can respond to the world from the heart. And I think that's where the area that where we can resolve a lot of things where the thinking cannot resolve. Um, often I meet people who have a lot of worry and anxiety. And worry and anxiety have certainly reasons for being there. So the thinking mind has to have some sense of planning or what can be done. But you and I know that worry and anxiety is not the same as planning and strategic thinking. They're two different realms. Sometimes we individually don't see where those realms are. We get caught up in, in, in our worries or whatever, but they are different. And so the question is, how do you resolve something like worry? How does it get resolved? Does it get resolved through more thinking? No doesn't get resolved through more thinking because thinking begets thinking. Does it get resolved by trying to get rid of thinking? No, because that's, that's the kind of violence we do to ourselves. And it's not effective. I, I've, I've certainly tried it, trying to get rid of thought because thought is natural. There's nothing unnatural about thinking. So how might we, in this case, how might we resolve worry? And I would suggest that you resolve it by having more trust and faith in the heart, literally in the heart, developing the heart chakra, uh, developing that sensitivity and awareness that one has in a tragic situation. Tragic situation is there, or maybe a very um, delightful, loving situation. Like you have a grandchild, and you're playing with a grandchild, and the heart just very, very easily opens. So it's there. It's not there. But to be in touch with it in a more constant way, to me, is the development of the Brahma Viharas, the, the practices of loving kindness and compassion. And these are what they're very, very, they're mostly described in a very, um, uh, in a very wordy way in Theravada Buddhism. There are lists and there are practices that we do, but the feeling that I had in that funeral home or that I have in other situations, is not a bunch of thinking. The thinking might lead to that, might or might not, but that heartfelt sense is, is like a different faculty for me. It's a very important faculty. And so I find that in developing body awareness, to begin to link what the body does um, in, in, in these various situations, normal life situations that we have become more conversant with the heart and also with the other areas of contraction and breath that we have in the body. And so this is a body awareness, which isn't trying to create any kind of samadhi experience, but it's more like a body awareness that is um, bodily intelligent. Could we say that? It's, it's more like you're understanding how your body functions and, and um, what it can tell you, what you can learn from it. If you, if you like say something, if you're contemplating worry, first of all, you have to see worry as an object. That's a big step. Someone can be worrying and worrying and not realize, well, actually worry is also an object. They can be so caught up in the worry themselves. So being able to actually just say, oh, this is worry, worry feels this way, is the beginning of enlightenment, is the, is the awakened mind. Some people never do that. They just worry, and then they pick up one worry and another worry, and then a third worry, and then they get distracted with something else. So this is mindfulness. This is awakening to the way things are. Because if we're only 
if we're only caught in the narratives of our lives, then of course we don't see the underlying uh, habits and, and tendencies which cause us suffering. And hence there's no end to suffering. So I found that um, just like simple things like face meditations, just, and, and I, in this little meditation that we did, I, I used the word waiting. And I used that quite deliberately. And um, also like waiting, but waiting for nothing or letting something become conscious. I noticed there's someone who's eating. Could the person who's eating not eat during the talk, please? Because that's in, in, our, in our Buddhist tradition, we should just be listening. So I'd appreciate that. That'd be very kind. Thank you. Um, so in, 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 awakening, in awakening to the body, and, and seeing what the, the body feels, say in, in one has to kind of listen and be aware and let the body speak to you. And that's why I find the word waiting is very, very helpful. So when I say to you, listen to sound, and let sound come to you, you're not you're not kind of going out into the object. You're not trying to find a sound or find a solution or do anything. And that brings you to the background. And you know that's the analogy I like to use: background and foreground. So when you when you have a more like a, a waiting perspective, just wait. Let things become conscious. You get a sense that the foreground is the movement, and the background is the silence, silent conscious knowing awareness. And and that really is a refuge. That really is peaceful. Now our attention, of course, gets drawn to the foreground of our experience of our emotional life or of our thinking life, the pain in my knee, uh, of some memory that comes up. So attention is constantly being preoccupied and taken up with the foreground activities. We have to do that to some extent, we have to do that. But um, if we have no way of not doing that, then we never find that future peace. So in the suggestion of just waiting, like if I just listen to, to the sounds here, just wait. The sounds become apparent, but also what becomes apparent is the peace of the mind. If I'm looking for some sound, the peace of the mind doesn't become very, it doesn't become apparent because I'm looking for something and that already is not peaceful. So by localizing attention and then just waiting, so you could do that with a face. So if I do that with a face, and the muscles around the eyes and the head uh, and the mouth and so on, I'll notice there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of life there. And if I become familiar and conversant with that way of awareness, then I'll see how much thinking impacts the facial muscles, the temples, the forehead, the eyes, all become impacted through thinking. So now I've got a way of maybe contemplating thinking without trying to get rid of thinking. I've got a way of contemplating worry, which is thinking, through the body. Not by trying to get rid of it, but understanding, oh, with this kind of activity called thought, there's this kind of result called tension. And if I'm aware of the tension in the face, in the forehead, in the eyes, what happens? Well, I'm, then I'm more with the background. I'm more with the peace of the mind. The habit of worry might be, the habit of tension might be there, but now I've got an alternative. I've got this background, silent knowing. If I wait, if I try to fix it, then I'll never notice, notice the silence of the mind. Now, going back to the heart chakra and, and that, one of the things that I found um, very profitable to do is to explore the throat, the heart, and the bailing. And initially I did a lot of that exploration because I had uh, a lot of fear and anxiety and um, uh, self-disparagement, the whole nine yards of those kinds of mindsets. And when I tried to get rid of the fear, of course, that never worked. But when I began to just witness fear, as a bodily experience, then I, I saw that the throat chakra was very tight. 
and and just by by like by we it's just um localizing my attention at the throat chakra this is fear going on because of something in my life forget what but it doesn't matter and then just with allowing allowing the throat to speak to me as it were okay body say something say whatever you want and then what comes up is the tension in the throat and then i found myself yawning big big yawning going on just this opening of that whole area which is tight with fear years of fear not just like a little nervousness about something years of fear and then of course that opening then and contemplating the heart chakra uh, i found that was very uh, unresponsive until i was afraid and when i was afraid well i said yeah there's a there's a response there so then with the fear i tried to say well what is fear as a bodily experience so again I had to know that fear is an object. If I didn't, if I didn't take that step, then I was just afraid, and then go into worry, thought, and anxious thought. So the first step is always awakening to the way things are. So then, to, you know, the project becomes: so can I make this this seemingly horrible habit of emotional fear? Can I make it something that's actually interesting, edifying, something that I can learn from? And it is that way when when it is observed or investigated, not through thought, but through body awareness. So the attention now is um, directed by thought. I could say, well, what is what is what's going on with my throat? But now the attention is just waiting and allowing this area to become conscious, to become conscious. And so the body comes alive in a way which it was, wasn't before, because now it has the power of attention on it. Consciousness is sort of lodged there. So I found in, in the, in the uh, processing of my, the karma of my own fears and anxieties that just doing that work a lot, or, or anger or resentments, the fears lodged in the belly, just constantly being aware of that, allowing that to open, yawn, and be what it was, was tremendously liberating, tremendously liberating at a level I didn't expect because the level I was dealing with fear was always at the thought level. You know, if I, if I deal with this that way, if I deal with this this way, so it was always a, a projection of the future, how I'm going to deal with fearful situations, anxious situations, worrisome things, but it never ended because the cycles, because I was trying to resolve in the wrong way, I was trying to use thought where thought was very limited. It, it's kind of like I want to make sauerkraut. So I make sauerkraut. What do I use? Cabbage? Chop up. Okay, I like sauerkraut. <laughs> Chop up the cabbage. Right? Get salt. Get some dill. Some spices. Knead them all up. Put them in a jar. And wait a while. And sauerkraut. So then I see, well, that white stuff really works for sauerkraut. I think I'll make a, I'll make a lemon meringue pie. So then I take the salt and I put it in a lemon meringue pie. What well, does it work? And that's thought. Thought doesn't work sometimes. You can't make lemon meringue, unless you want salty meringue pie. <laughs> now I'm going to get sauerkraut and meringue pies the rest of my life. <laughs> But you see what I mean? We, we have so much trust in thought. We have so much faith in thought that often thought is salt and we need sugar. Do you see what I mean? You see the analogy? So why do we have so much faith in thought? Because it's wrong understanding. So when the mind is perpetuating worry, why don't we say, well, trust in the heart as a way of awareness? Trust in the heart rather than trust in thought. And I think that change for me was very, very important. Because thought is very useful. Like in weaving, when I'm setting up the loom and the patterns, it's very mathematical. It's very binary. So thought is very, very useful in that way. But with fear and worry, it was not useful. It was just a perpetuation of that. So... As we develop more 
true body awareness, like really awakening to the body, not, not just something superficial, like really awakening and knowing this embodied experience we have as human beings. As we, as we engage with that, I would say, then the, 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 the fears and worries which are, and anxieties which are driven by ego thinking, wrong thinking, uh, and all the, the habits of our life, they begin to dissipate because we are resolving them. And we're resolving them but because we know them. And we know them in the full light of awareness without trying to get rid of them, without making a judgment about them. They get liberated from consciousness and from the body. And the result of that is then the bodily, the possibilities of experiencing love, kindness, compassion, and joy. These become much more enhanced. Because the, the whole system of our, of our life is open. It's not just congealed into thinking. If we're just in, in, in the kind of tightness of thought, then sure, we'll feel kindness. Sure, we'll feel, we'll feel compassion. We're not, you know, we're not cruel or, or, or uh, lacking in that way. But I think this deeper sense of what awareness is, it, it, it seems to me that awareness is a deeper connection to life than just some sense of knowing what's going on in a functional way or being careful not to build a sauerkraut all over the floor or whatever it is. Not just kind of functional controlling presence, but something much, much deeper. And, and, and this sense of abiding more with the heart, with the openness of our lives, then um, puts us in, in a relationship to nature and people where things get um, taken care of in, 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 a, in a kind of beautiful way. Nature becomes much more apparent. Uh, the beauty of nature becomes much more apparent. And I would say that's what mudita is. When we talk about the Brahma Viharas, the joy of the, the human experience. And, and then our response to tragedy and, 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 and all of that is enhanced, actually, by actually feeling that which is tragic. And deep, deeply in our own being. But that's not worry. That's not depression. That's not negative at all. It's very human and very uh, actually enriching. So, I mean, it's a horrible thing to say, maybe, but that funeral was an enrichment for me. You know, like, you know, it's a horrible way, maybe, of talking. But if you see what I mean, I was given this opportunity to really feel deep, the deep pain of someone else the deep loss and tragedy of someone else. And, and I just stayed with that feeling. I just stayed with the feeling and stayed with it. And that made me a more compassionate being. When we see the news cycles, which are just overwhelming sometimes, then it's very, it's very hard to stay with the heart and not go to the, the horrible narratives that are going on. But that's not compassion. That's horror. And, and and the kind of voyeurism of our news cycles that that, that we uh, that we are subjected to. So, uh, like, just if I go back to the sense of resolving something, like if you if you find, like, does your mind worry a lot? Is your mind anxious a lot? How does that get resolved? How does that get resolved? Does it get resolved through more thinking or distraction? Or does it get resolved by going to another place, to another area of your experience, which is still involved with the worry or the anxiety? I would suggest that then this kind of meditation uh, of actually feeling the heart, going to the heart, feeling the throat, feeling the, the abdomen and, and the tensions that that produces, uh, becoming conversant with that. It's kind of like, like when you, if you've never done bird watching and then you start getting involved in bird watching, you know, after a couple of years, you can recognize the form of a bird across the field. And it's not much. It's not much. It just might be the white of the tail of a, 
of a northern flicker, or it might be the sound of a grackle as opposed to a red winged blackbird or something, you know, it's not much. But why do you know that? Because you've taken the time to notice it. You've had your field glasses out, you've looked at your book, and you've seen, well, there's these two blackbirds that are close together, and, and oh yeah, one's got a red wing, and then you look it up and it's a grackle amongst a bunch of, it's, it's a red winged blackbird and a bunch of, bunch of grackles. So, now you've got a kind of perception of nature which you didn't have before, and you become more sensitive. So I'd suggest that in the same way, when you start to take an interest in the heart chakra, not just its stimulation when things are stimulating to that, but actually in an ongoing meditative way, then that enlivens that sensitivity. And then that sensitivity serves you very, very well in your response to life, and the resolution of life's problems, because life will always be problematic. It's not, it's not predictable. The words that we use in the Metta Sutta uh, are are very beautiful. By not holding to uh, the, uh, that's the line I always go to. But this is what should be done. If you take that Sutta in the English translation. And you just use it as a as a as a statement in your meditation. You just say it slowly to yourself. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the peace, path of peace. Let them be able, and so on and so forth. You say that through. That has a beautiful impact on your mind. And that resonates through your mind through the day. But these are things that need to be done uh, on a regular basis, right? And this is why we say practice. Um, I like actually, I like, I like the Sufi tradition because they don't call themselves practitioners. They call themselves lovers. And I rather like that. But if I call us lovers here, I might get thrown out. <laughs> but I, 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 I rather like what's that saying about the spiritual life, right? But I got to be careful. I think I'm just a bit da da getting old. So we're practitioners, but but it does take practice. One has to engage with these sensitivities and enhance them and 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 make them kind of vibrant in, in your life. Just out of passively sitting down and hoping the breath will somehow do it for you. Usually, people just fall asleep. That's a very passive kind of approach. If they just watch the breath, they'll be enlightened. Thank you. And most people hit the concrete with their heads. There has to be life in this practice, right? There has to be some interest and kind of enlivening quality. And I, and, and I would suggest that the this part of our life, this, this, this breathing apparatus that we have and, and the throat and the heart and all of that, it's very alive. But we have to bring our attention down from the heart, from the head to the heart. It's a cliche. It's a cliche, but there's a lot of truth in that. There's truth around the truth. Then when we have that, then we can use the rational mind, the analytical mind, very, very well, very skillfully. But we realize its place. We realize its limits. And that and in some areas, it can't resolve. We have to use another part of our, our wisdom. And the heart has a lot of wisdom in that way. So I think that's quite a lot to ponder. So I'll leave that for your reflection tonight. Now, I don't know if I can ask for questions, but I don't think I can. So, is there anyone in the Ottawa Buddhist Society there? Do I have a voice? Ajahn, can you hear me? Nisanka, can you speak? Yeah, I no. can speak. Everyone's muted. Well, there you go. Can you hear me? Can't be all bad. <laughs> Well, I don't know what to do. What do you? What, what should I do then? Let's. How about some of you probably know the the uh, uh, discourse on loving kindness. Um, we could chat that. You could follow along. You guys got the books. Do we have books for that? I have a few people in the room here. The pages are on full. 32, 33. So join along if you want, or just listen.
Yeah, 30, 33, we'll do the English. Through the goodness that arises from my practice, May my spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, my mother, my father, and my relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders. Uh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I want the meta suit. That's not what I want. He got sharing with Mary. He gave me the wrong page. We're getting there. Okay. Yeah. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. With a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness, over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Right, okay. Sorry I can't take any questions because life is that way. C'est la vie. So I guess we close, huh? Yeah. Okay. So bye bye, everyone. Be well. Stay healthy. See you next time. Ciao.